けど。Everyone have a prayer. I'll hold up the card for those on Zoom if you don't have it, and、um, we'll say this together, okay? Glory be to the Father, who by his almighty power and love created me in his image and likeness. Glory be to the Son, who in his incarnation became man, so that I could become God. Glory be to the Holy Spirit, who divinizes me in the Son and makes me a partaker of his divine nature. Glory be to the holy and undivided Trinity. Now and forever. Amen. It is recording, and I'm going to just put our 11 Zoom participants on mute. And if you would like to jump in or say anything, just、uh, unmute yourself, a little icon at the bottom of the page.、Um, you'll also know the, notice on the bottom of your Zoom, this is just kind of little housekeeping stuff here before we get rolling. Um, there's a stop video icon, should be at the bottom left hand side of all your Zoom formats for you guys who are watching from the computer. And if you're going to、uh, get up and move about or do anything that might be distracting to others, if you just hit the stop video, this is what will happen. You see a picture will go up or your name will go up, and、um, that will keep others from seeing what you're up to. Don't,、uh, yeah. I won't say anything more. So be, be aware, be prudent, be, be, be self aware. Okay.、Uh, so、uh, I was hoping to have a, a, a newcomer to the Zoom today, my friend Adam from, but he's in Costa Rica and he said he would try it again, but maybe he doesn't have connectivity. And I thought I would go, if he was here, I'd go through the whole. The whole paradigm for our gathering, but、um, I don't need to do that because we have a lot of old timers here, some in the room, some on the computer. So, does someone have a, an issue they want to start with or a topic that we want to explore today? I have a funeral at noon today after,、yeah. our, after our gathering. So, there's always the great topic of death. <laughs>、uh, One thing、yeah. I, I asked you the last time do we have a personal? Angel protecting us, or not, like they say, you know. So, the question from Maria today is Do we have a personal angel protecting us? And the answer to that is yes, we do. We have a guardian angel. In my case, I have two guardian angels. Yeah. <laughs> And maybe I'll, maybe I'll tell you the story.、Uh, I'll tell you the story of how do I know I have two guardian angels? Yeah.、Um, so, um, So, I v e I heard for a long time, and I knew for a long time, that Padre Pio, the famous priest who had the stigmata over in Italy, Petrolacina, Padre Pio of Petrolacina, people used to travel before there was internet and before there was Zoom. People used to travel on a very dangerous, mountainous road up in a rickety bus to go up to the top of this hill where the monastery where Padre Pio was. He became very famous for having the stigmata and he would celebrate Mass every morning. I think it was at 5 a.m. and people would start gathering in the church around 2 a.m. So there were whole pilgrimages of people and there are people even in St. Louis who met Padre Pio. Uh, our friend Frank, who used to be a regular at our meetings and is close to 100 years old,、wow. he, uh, he met Padre Pio and、um, Padre Pio gave him a blessing. And I think he's always worn a medal of Padre Pio's. He was a fighter pilot in the Second World War and says he was delivered from many a death trap by the intervention of Padre Pio. And I, I mentioned Padre Pio, whose feast day was just a little while ago. He always had a great devotion to his guardian angel. And they also said that Padre Pio had you know, many gifts, the stigmata for one, the gift of bilocution. So he could be in two places at one time. People would report having spoken with him, even though they were miles apart.、Um, he also had a gift of reading people's sins when they would come into confession. Uh, maybe I'll tell you that story today. Maybe today will be a day of stories. Who knows? This, this, we never know quite where, 
the gathering is going to go. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, I'll tell you a kind of a modern day Padre Pio story uh, of, of my own journey. Um, so I knew Padre Pio, I knew him, I knew his fame. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, the thing you want to remember most about Padre Pio was his humility. Because after people started coming up in caravans to mm. watch him celebrate mass, because they wanted to get a glimpse of his stigmata and he used to wear he used to wear black gloves that covered everything but his fingers because the wounds were in his palms, but they were visible. Um, they disappeared, by the way, at the moment of his death. They went away completely after, after his death. Uh, but they were very visible and very, apparently very painful as well. But once he attracted fame, um, the, the other monks in the monastery got jealous for one thing, but, but th th they also... He was living in a Franciscan. He was a Franciscan priest, so they 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 didn't want a lot of attraction to them. They wanted to serve humbly. They didn't want to be famous, so they they asked Padre Pio not to celebrate Mass publicly for a couple of years, and not not to hear confessions either, because people heard that he had a gift for discernment. That uh, and there are many stories of of people coming into confession, Padre Pio telling them what they were there for. And, uh, and he would sometimes say to them, now I've heard the sins you, I've heard the sins you've confessed. Now do you want to also tell me about this one? And he would, <laughs> he would name the sin and then and, and they would. And for many people, that was a great moment of their conversion because it signaled to them that there is kind of a supernatural reality that maybe they didn't know about before, or they had even excluded a little bit because of their boxy Catholicism that tries to put God in a box sometimes. So anyway, Padre Pio, so he, he really was perfectly obedient. He never spoke to reporters. He never, he never complained to the, to the Pope. He never complained to his superiors. He said, I'll do whatever you ask of me. And after a while, they, it was really his humility that allowed, that gave, that, that they gave him permission to start celebrating mass again. And there was a, um, there was a very famous Catholic woman, a single one. She went over to see Padre Pio, and I don't know exactly how they how how it happened, but he met her, and she ended up devoting her whole life to taking care of him and his illness. She was his housekeeper, and she was his go-between. She was an American woman, Mary Dean, I think was her name. Mary, somebody who knows Padre Pio out there can 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 inform me, but. Very simple name, simple woman, but very holy as well. Um, and Padre Pio had a great devotion to the guardian angels. And he, he, said, I, he, he said, I talk to my guardian angel. I see my guardian angel. I, mm. I, I converse with him. And, um, and you, should, you also should have a, a close relation with your guardian angel. So I always knew that. I also heard that Padre Pio or somebody in the Padre Pio tradition um, alleged that that anyone could know the name of their guardian angel because apparently people would ask Padre Pio well, how do you how do you how do you find out how does your guardian angel communicate to you and he says well what you should do and I hesitate to tell you this because I don't yeah, want it to sound hokey um, anyway I'll, I'll tell you what 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 either the rumor is or the understanding is or the the the, the, the director from Padre Pio, and I don't know that he ever said this, so don't say that I said he said it. Okay. But what I heard was, if you want to know the name of your guardian angel before you go to bed at night, and a lot of people still probably say the guardian angel prayer to watch over me during the night, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but you, I was given it recently as a penance. I went to confession on the feast of the guardian angels, and the priest said, do you remember the prayer to the guardian angels? I said, no. no. And he said, well, go home and look it up on the internet and say it tonight before you go to bed. That's your penance. It's a very beautiful prayer. Apparently, there are a lot of guardian angel prayers, but angel of God, my guardian dear, to, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule and guide. Nice. So beautiful prayer. So they said, the the, the 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 suggestion was <laughs> the suggestion was before you go to bed suggestion this is what 
the rumor was. If you want to know the name of your guardian angel before you go to bed, ask your guardian angel the following day to reveal their name to you in one way or another. And then the next day, don't even try to think about it. Just, just you'll know it when it happens, but don't go around the whole next day saying, now what, what's my name, what's your name? Just forget, ask about it before you go to bed. Don't even think about it the next day and it will occur to you in some way, the guardian angel, because they don't communicate, they, they're pure spirits. So, and yeah, we're gonna have a whole session today, I think on angels, because I started this, I started to say last week, and I've said consistently on these gatherings that a big stream of tradition in the early church was that all the angels, including the fallen angels, which are estimated to be about a third of all the angels God ever created, that in the end, even the evil angels would be restored to perfect communion with God. They would, as it were, repent, such as it would mean that for angels, okay? And, and we will touch again on that because I'm a firm believer in that for lots of reasons, and I'll touch on those. Not going to be a gathering focused around the salvation of the evil angels and the emptying of hell. It's going to be on um, the, the presence of guardian angels and the presence of God and the goodness of God, which is also the redemption of the angels. So, so I thought, to, so I was at that time, I had left the priesthood. Yeah, I'm going to, you're going to get a full, you're getting both barrels today. So okay, go ahead. We're ready. We're ready for it. All right. So then I have to look up on my, it's entertaining. I will look. Yeah, it's entertaining. Well, I'm an entertainer to begin with. Uh, I know. So I'm going to um, eventually read you something here I need to get from my phone. So I'll queue it up so that I'm ready to go. Okay. So, so at, at the time that I, at the time that I heard this about your guardian angel, and I can't remember, oh, I was, I had already left the priesthood. I had already been married. My son was by this time, 16 years old. 18 years old, I was now, I was now free to re-enter re the priesthood. Um, I had been trying to find a bishop who would take me for at least 10 years at that point. It took another seven years beyond that. But during this time that I was free and clear of responsibility to my son and to my, to my son's mom, whom I both love, I mean, I love my son more than anybody in the world and love his mom right in tandem with him because without her, there's no him. And without us, there's no him. And she continues to be one of the greatest gifts God ever gave me. I always say, and led me and helped me out of the priesthood so that I could discover the real meaning of the priesthood. And that still is today. And I'll tell you that story some other time at greater length, but, but suffice it to say, all is good. Everything that happens is good if we only had the eyes to see it. Yeah. But anyway, as I was now free and hoping there I would find a bishop who would take me, I was invited. I was teaching at the time, teaching in a Catholic college in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I taught many years in the theology department there, doing much of what uh, I was developing. I was already developing this Trinitarian vision uh, during those years, but I hadn't fully awakened to the early church vision of, of Trinitarian deification. I had not yet awakened to that. Well, I, actually, I actually I had, but I was still early in, in the time of God teaching me how to, how to extend the great phrase of Athanasius, God became man so man could become God. That was the great awakening for me. And then I saw that everything in the Christian mm -hmm. life and everything in the world actually flows out from that, that the union of of God with created the created world in the incarnation was at that very moment, the redemption of the whole created world. And the created world includes all the broken beings in the world, including the broken angels. Everything was redeemed the moment, the moment God sent his son to become one with creation. How could it not? He, is, he, he brings divinity into humanity. So everything is healed brought up into him, even though it's taking a long time to manifest 
the results. Anyway, that's the, the overall vision. So that vision was growing in me and um, I was promoting this vision in the different classes that I was teaching. And one of the classes I was asked to teach was the was a course to the men who were preparing to become permanent deacons in the Diocese of Grand Rapids. And, um, well, I won't say anything about men preparing to become permanent deacons. They, 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 they are, they're, let's just say they, they, are, they are very motivated and their intentions are not always completely spiritual but they're always good people and, and they have a passion and they want to serve and they want, and they, they require spiritual and theological formation. So I was asked because I was teaching at the college, one of my college, um, prof, uh, one of my call, my, I think my college, uh, the, the chairman of the department, they asked him to teach this course with the permanent deacons. And he said, I'm not available, but I think uh, Phil Krill would be happy to teach it. So I, and I was happy to teach it. I was happy that the diocese let me do that knowing um, I had already, um, well, it, yeah, I guess maybe I hadn't. Oh, I know uh, this happened during the time. You see, I was hoping to be taken back into the priesthood in Grand Rapids where my, my son was raised, where I lived with his mom, where I spent over 25, 30 years. So I, I went to the bishop there when I first knew that I wanted to come back to the priesthood. My son, Ben, was six years old at the time. There was a priest friend of mine who took great pity on me. He saw that I was a former priest, that I had this beautiful son, that I had been divorced, and he knew that I wanted to come back into the priesthood. So he became my kind of my advocate. And he said, I think our local bishop, if I were to advocate for you, would be happy to have you as a priest. So I thought maybe next week I'll be serving in a parish again. So we went down to see the bishop and he said, well, if Father Don, who happened to be the diocesan exorcist, he said, if Father Don was a, probably the holiest priest in the whole diocese, he's, he's now got a very severe case of Alzheimer's. I go to him every time I'm in Grand Rapids because I know he can't remember my sins. He can't, he can't. So always a blessing, you know, Alzheimer's can be a blessing in a priest if you want a good confessor. And they should have Alzheimer's anyway, with respect to anybody who comes to them. Anyway, my friend, Father Don, who at the time did not have Alzheimer's, took me down to see the bishop. And the bishop said, if Father Don vouches for you, I'd be happy to have you as a priest. So I'm thinking, great, I'm back in. <laughs> and he said, uh, how old is your son? And I said, six. And he says, well, before you can actually function as a priest, uh, he needs to be 18. <laughs> he said, so he said, are you willing to wait 12 years to come into the diocese? Oh, and I said, yeah, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to wait. I'm, I wasn't happy, but I said, yeah, I'm willing, willing to wait 12 years. So uh, that bishop, so that went along for six years. So by now my son is 12 years old, and, uh, but that bishop retires when my son is 12. So there's a new bishop who comes in. By this time, my son turns 13. And I don't have the chronology exact here, but my son is, keeps getting older as people do. <laughs> and we get a new bishop. And so we make the same trip down because the new bishop is not bound to anything the old bishop decided. So the new bishop's in charge. I have no credibility now, but I still have my friend, Father Don. So he drags me down to the new bishop and we meet him. He's a really nice guy in his early 50s, full of life, very spiritual. He says, if Father Don vouches for you, I'm happy to have you. How old is your son? I said, 13. He says, you got five more years. But he says, I expect to be here. You're good as gold. Well, a year later, he died. He, oh. he went to Rome, got bit by a mosquito, oh. developed encephalitis, and died in Rome with a brain aneurysm. Mm. So by this time, my son's 14. And then we get a new bishop. Well, no, then we're two years without a bishop. Rome doesn't appoint anyone. We have the vicar general functioning as the manager of the diocese. You sure you want to hear all this? Yes, yeah. yes, okay. yes, so two years later, we get a new bishop. So we make our third trip down and we go down to the bishop. Even before the conversation starts, he says, I don't want you. Oh, wow. wow. He said, I, uh, I don't take anybody who's been divorced. 
He said, you'll have to look for another diocese. So I bye, bye. He said, nope, don't want to talk about it. He says, uh, I wish you well, but he says, not going to happen for you here. Wow. Oh, okay. Now, I, I need to back up a little bit because while that second bishop who came, who was in his early 50s and he was nice, well, during this whole time, I was still teaching at this college. I was teaching theology. And at a certain point, probably before that bishop turned me down, but prior to that, a year or so prior to that, I was teaching in this permanent diaconate program. And I, and I, and I came in, it was called um, liturgical theology. So it's the theology and the liturgy. What's happening? What's happening in the Eucharist? There was a priest here yesterday who's going to talk to the same priest I talked to in Tulsa several months ago, and they've invited another St. Louis priest. I don't know if it was because they were pleased or disappointed in me, but anyway, they wanted another one from St. Louis, either to redeem my performance or to add to it. Uh, and this priest, I didn't, he, we're friends, and I didn't, and he came to see me and he said, you know, now, how should I speak to these priests and what should I say about the Eucharist? So we had a nice chat about that. But I was teaching this course in Eucharistic theology to these permanent deacons called liturgical theology. And it was about the whole liturgy, all the sacraments, not just the Eucharist, but liturgical theology. And um, I taught the first class and said it all starts and ends with the Trinity. And you have to understand that the liturgy basically is the Trinity extending it into time and space in order to draw all people into itself. And if you stopped with your vision of Christianity with that, you'd know all you need to know. God gave Christ in the incarnation so he could give us the liturgy, and the liturgy is given to us to create the church, and the church is given to us to draw all people in the world into the Trinitarian mystery that is present in the Eucharist. So the incarnation is given for the purpose of the Eucharist, the Eucharist is given for the purpose of the church. The church is given for the purpose of the transformation of the cosmos. And it's that simple. Well, anyway, I talk like this, as I do for a couple hours. I think the class was actually three hours. You think the gathering's long. We used to take a break and go at it again. And so, um, so after the class, and I could tell, as I always can tell in these classes, especially with permanent deacons, um, most of them have, of course, never heard what I was saying about the Trinity. They've never made any connection between anything they do and the Trinity, even though every bond of friendship that we enjoy, especially the bond of marriage, comes because we are simply living out in our own human way the Trinitarian bondedness of the Father and the Son. We are all gripped by love, but very few of us realize the source of that love comes from the original gripping, which is in the life of the Trinity. So I can go on, as you know, for hours and hours about this, because it is the seminal mystery of the Christian faith. It's the seminal mystery of the cosmos. And I was waxing strong about this. So after class, so, so I can, and, and I was, of course, I'm always monitoring the, the reactions of people. And most of them are like this. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> and then there's always, I would say, probably 17 to 20 percent who go. <laughs> ooh, ooh, he's messing with my boxes. He's messing with my Catholicism. I spent my whole life constructing a view of how I'm relating to God. And now he's telling me that doesn't work. And of course, that's not what I'm telling her. I, well, anyway, I could tell you other stories about students who have reported me to the archbishop for teaching heresy <laughs> and, and little inquisition trials I've gone through with the archbishop and with the uh, powers that be at the archdiocese for, but then that's a perfect opportunity to introduce them to the Trinity because they don't know anything <laughs> about it either. So all that being said, after that first class with the... Um, this is a long way of around telling you about the guardian angels, but you need to know this background, okay, for the main event coming up here. 
So there's a guy who, there's one of the permanent deacons. And by the way, you remember that bishop who came in? He came in two years. He came in a year after I was teaching this class with the deacons. These, these deacons, so, well, let me, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So after that class, one of the deacons who's in his fifth year of diaconate formation. So he's been going through this formation for five years. This is the last course he's taking. He comes up to me after class and he said, I've been waiting my whole life to hear this version of Catholicism. I always knew something was missing. He said, I can't believe what I just heard. He said, I am a, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a developer and I own several companies and I consult with major companies all around the world for supply chain management. I go all over the world, but my real passion is for the faith. And I, and, and, and my spiritual director is Michael Fonseca. And I'd heard about Michael Fonseca. Michael Fonseca, if you look him up on the internet, he's got several very beautiful books that you would do well to buy and look into. He was a former Jesuit provincial who was the provincial for Anthony DeMello, if you know that name. Michael Fonseca was Anthony DeMello's spiritual director and left the Jesuits to marry in good graces with the church and with the Jesuits. And now he landed in Grand Rapids and he had over a hundred people seeing him for spiritual direction. So he was doing spiritual direction full time. And my friend Jeff, who approached me after the, the diaconate class, he said, Michael Fonseca and I, who's my spiritual director, want to start a lay Catholic formation program. We want to we want to uh, develop a retreat house. We call it God's Embrace, where the Trinity is embracing the world. And um, we have Michael as the spiritual director. We have me as the business entrepreneur, putting it all together, getting the building permits, getting the program permits, setting up the venues, promoting the program. But we're missing a theologian. Would you be willing to be our third? Would you be, we could then make kind of a mini trinity of a God's Embrace retreat team. And I said, well, let's you and I and Michael meet. And that led to a five year, very melodious um, uh, communion among the three of us. And we, we ended up, we started, it's a little more detail than you need to know, but it brings back good memories for me. So I'm going to recount it to you. Michael and Jeff and I said, now, how will we introduce this? Who, who, who would be interested in this program and how do we get it out there? And so it became clear that I had taught many students at this college over the course of many years. And I was doing also at that time in my friend, Father Don's parish, St. Isidore's parish in Grand Rapids, doing a lot of adult education. So there were a lot of adults who were interested in growing more in this Trinitarian vision. I used to teach classes on Ignatius of Loyola, uh, St. John of the Cross, St. Carmelite spirituality, Marian piety from a Trinitarian perspective. So there were a lot of adults who were not exactly Phil Krill groupies, but they wanted, you could tell that when I explained to them what Athanasius was trying to say, like most people who are open, it just grabbed them and they wanted to know more. So that then became my life's mission. And we had many people interested in this vision. So we decided to launch the program. We And Jeff, of course, and Michael, they had a whole curriculum of lesson plans that would go for three years. They developed a very year lay formation program. And, uh, but we had no participants. So we had to introduce it to somebody. We got the program ready ahead of time. Then we decided to do three Lenten presentations at the college where I was teaching and to promote them locally. And Michael also was spiritual director for people in other cities. So we actually had people actually flying in for these Lenten, three Lenten presentations. And I believe they're still available on the internet. I'll have to talk to my friend Jeff. And if they are, I can send you a link. You can see me back and you can see me 25 years ago oh. uh, starting to promote this Trinitarian vision. Any case, we had three Lenten um, sessions where the three of us presented. And that was a 
a really interesting time because we learned how the three of us worked together and how presentations should occur. So in our first one, Michael kind of led off and get, gave an introduction, then I talked after it and Jeff added a few comments at the end, but, but it became very clear after the first session that I should lead off and give kind of a, a, an inspiring overview. And then we take a break and then Michael would come back and tell people how then to make that practical in their own spiritual lives. And then Jeff would come back with logistical stuff about the next few sessions. So, so we learned our own routine there. Our team eventually dissolved because I was reported, we did a presentation one time at the end of five years together. We were invited to do a summer presentation to a group of Catholic grade school teachers. We did a presentation and it was on the, on the priesthood. The, the, the topic was the, the, the current church, but the topic of priesthood came up and there were a lot of radical feminists there, one of whom taught at the same college where I was teaching and they were basically trashing the priesthood and said, said the priesthood has lost all credibility ever since the abuse scandal. And I was not yet back in the priesthood, but at one point I felt, felt inspired to say, you know, all the things you're saying are true at the human level. I said, but supernaturally speaking, the priesthood is still a gift to the church from God, despite the unworthiness of every person who's in it. And I said, I said, to illustrate this topic, let me just assure you that if St. Francis of Assisi was walking down the street today and he came across a priest who was even an abuser, he would kiss the priest's hands and say, despite your sins, I still love you because you give me Jesus in the Eucharist. Well, that didn't go very well. Not only did that not go very well, I got a call. Michael Fonseca, my friend, who was doing a ton of spiritual direction, as I told you, in the Diocese of Grand Rapids, plus giving many presentations to the Curia there. And he was very well connected in Grand Rapids. He got a call from the vicar of priests in, in Grand Rapids, and the vicar said, unless you disassociate yourself and repudiate Phil Krill, today, you will never work another day in this diocese. Oh, wow. So Michael came to me and he said, my whole livelihood depends on being able to do spiritual direction here. And I said, well, in that case, I'll just, why don't I just step aside and we'll agree to go our, so that's how God's embrace ended on that note on one oh. sad summer day. Okay, but back uh, rewind for a little bit. Okay. When it was going well. So after those three Lenten presentations, we said there were about a hundred or 120 people who came to all three of those presentations. And at the end, we said, we have a three-year formation program that will continue what you've heard in these Lenten presentations at much greater length. It's going to involve a great commitment on your part. It's going to involve a financial commitment for the resources that we're going to use. We will have two two-hour in-person theological formation sessions every month, and every three months we will have a three-day retreat, a contemplative retreat, with 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours of Lexio Divina, and another 10 to 14 hours of Eucharistic adoration. So if this is something you're interested in, see us after the session today, and we'll begin our formal God's Embrace retreat program. So we had... We had 35 people sign up after those sessions. And for three years, we did a formation program. At the end of those three years, I got a call from Bishop, then Bishop Carlson in Saginaw saying, I would like to take you into my, or I had written to him, we were in dialogue and he said, I will take you. And he said, I'd also like to know more about this lay formation program that you're involved in. And lo and behold, three years later, a similar version shows up in St. Louis. So I'm pretty sure that's where it came from, because we laid out to him all the materials and they've tweaked it a little bit, but ours was actually much greater, even greater in depth than the one that is current in St. Louis, but the one in St. Louis is a great fruit of that God's Embrace retreat ministry. Well, okay, all that being said, that's the context. So we were on one of these every three month weekend retreats with our 35 God Embrace, God's Embrace um, retreat participants. And we're at this retreat house, and um, we're talking about angels. 
And there is a woman there who, who, uh, who ha was very spiritually gifted, maybe not as much as Padre Pio, but I recognized, um, I recognized that she had a certain gift of discernment. And um, she, she would occasionally say things to me about, about myself and my journey back, back to the priesthood. She said, she said, God is making it clear to me that this is the time that you will be taken back into the priesthood and that, and that this is finally the time for you to do. This is even before Carlson took me or even before I knew Carlson. But anyway, we, I don't know, we got talking about angels and she said, well, if you really want to know the, guard, the, the name of your guardian angel, go pray before you go to bed tomorrow night and uh, ask to be shown. And the next day you'll, you'll know it one way or another. So I did that. And then we had, it was the final day of our retreat. So I, I literally did forget about looking for the name of my guardian angel. I said the prayer. I said, God, if there's anything to this, show me the name of my guardian angel. And I also had a friend who was not in God's embrace, but he was coming to me for spiritual direction. He was always in the adult ed classes that I was teaching on divinization and the early church fathers. He sometimes even on our Wednesday gatherings, though I haven't seen him in quite a while, Stephen Roberts, also a very holy uh, Catholic convert, but a true mystic in every sense of the, of the word. And he said that he knew his guardian angel and that he had said that prayer and that he knew what his guardian angel's name was and that I should do it. And, and that if I would let him know what my guardian angel's name was, he would, he would pray to his guardian angel and see if it was true. So, so I thought, okay, I'll call Stephen too, if anything happens. So anyway, but I forgot, I, and it was the best way because I knew I wasn't making it up. I forgot about it completely. So we finished the retreat. Now the retreat was in Holland, Michigan, and I'm living by this time, actually by that time, Carlson had taken me back on the way to the priesthood, but I was spending a, a, a year in the Saginaw diocese administering a parish like a lay administer, like Deacon, Deacon Allen used to do here at St. Andrews. But, it, but Carlson gave me permission to keep coming back to Grand Rapids whenever we had a God's Embrace formation program going because I was not yet fully appointed to a parish. So I was shuttling back and forth between Grand Rapids and Saginaw, which is about two and a half hours apart from each other. Well, it's also the middle of the winter in Michigan. Oh, wow. So I get out of this retreat about six o'clock, six, no, I got out about seven, Michael and I, Jeff and I went to supper afterwards to kind of review the weekend and get ready for the next session. So I got out of Grand Rapids in the middle of a snowstorm about eight o'clock at night. Okay. So I'm driving through this blizzard up to Saginaw, you know, with the snow coming at you and the headlights. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm can, I can hardly see where I'm going. It's slow going. It's going to take, I can see now I got my little GPS there on my phone. Looks like I'm going to get in there about 1142 or something like that, you know? So I'm driving. I mean, I can hardly keep my eyes open. And um, so I'm driving and there's a, there's a, on the way, as I'm getting close to Saginaw, now it's right about 11 o'clock. I think it's like, yeah, it's like 11 o'clock. And I'm driving and finally I, the snow kind of breaks and uh, I drive through a place called Birch Run. It's about, it's about, well, it's very near, it's actually in Sag, the Saginaw city limits, but my parish was even further beyond Saginaw out in the country in a little Michigan town called Vassar, Michigan, you know, with, with one Catholic parish, St. Francis Cabrini, and I was the administrator. So I'm going through Birch Run, but Birch Run is one of these uh, outlet mall places, you know, and it's lit up by a thousand lights, you know, and I have forgotten about the guardian angel, but as I, as I come kind of come to from my driving with the lights, I said, oh, my guardian angel, I wonder the guardian angel, you know, so I'm, I'm going through and I, I see all these signs for ad, advertisements, you know, and I'm looking and I, and I, and I often stop at the, well, not often, but once in a while, if I had a little money in my pocket, I'd stop at the Polo Outlet store, you know? Okay. And um, so I go by, you know, and I see advertisements there for Ralph Lauren stuff, you know, and I go by, I don't think anything of it. And then I'm back out in the country again. And then it, it just occurs to me, Ralph Lauren. Ah. 
Ralph? Could my guardian angel, Ra Ralph? Oh, God. Lauren? Could it, could it be, could it be Lauren? So I start wondering, could it be Lauren? It was L-A-U, well, you know how Lauren is spelled. Yeah, yeah, Lauren. Yeah. Could it be Ralph? Could it, could it be? So I'm starting to puzzle over this, you know? And I'm thinking it's got to happen today. So, so why did I wait? So I'm, I'm starting to put two and two together here. Like, why did I come to going through Birch Run? And why did that sign get my attention? And my son and I used to have this thing about if a street light goes off, that's a signal that the guy goes off or comes on. That's a signal that the guardian angel is speaking to you. My phone just went on and off. That's why I noticed that. <laughs> um, we always took that as a signal grace that the guardian angel was with you and directing you and leading you and, and making you aware of things. That's what guardian angels do mostly. They make you aware of things that you may not otherwise, they draw your attention to things in very subtle ways. And you only know it's them after the fact when you put two and two together. So I'm starting to say, my God, I came wide awake. I saw this sign. The only one I remember is Ralph Lauren. So could it be Lauren or Lauren? Yeah. And so now I'm out on these country roads and now I really need my GPS because it's like route DD and YY and AA and Z. And I'm thinking, where the hell am I? Now it's snowing again and I'm lost. My GPS says it's rerouting and it's spinning, you know? So there's no, I don't even know where I am. And this is getting close to midnight and I don't know where I am. And it's a, it's a, it's a blizzard snowstorm. You're not going to believe this. I get chills just thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I don't know where I am. I gotta, I gotta put in some logistics here. I gotta figure out what the, what the, uh, what the intersection here is. So I slow down here. I'm looking for cars around. It's midnight, so there's nobody out on these. Paths. I turn on my high beams. There's snow coming down. I kind of look at the sign. It says Lauren Avenue. L-O-R-E-N Avenue. Lauren. I just pulled over and couldn't believe it. So my, by that time, my thing had stopped spinning. I turned right. I go back thinking could that really be so i get to my house i get unpacked it's now like five minutes to 12. i finally crawl into bed and i've got a little book of um meditations on the side of my bed and i and i and i said to god i said you know i'll i i i i don't do this often i did it one other time in my life i said but if lauren or so, if i'm on to the right thing about my guardian angel's name here, Lauren, um, could you, um, I know God, it's late and this is putting you on the spot and, and I know I'm dealing with fire here, but I said, is there, could I get one more sign that I'm on the right, or guardian angel, could you give me one more sign I'm on the right path? So I pick up my daily meditation for the day and I open the page and it's a meditation by brother Lawrence. <laughs> so I said, enough to know. So I said to myself, I've got to call my lady friend who told me about the guardian, I've got to call her and Stephen in the morning. So I call my friend, what's her name? I got to, let me see if it's on, because I want to read you what she wrote to me later. Let me see. If oh, I is can. it Lauren or Lawrence? Yeah, Lauren. Oh, is oh. The, is the... and you know what, you know what, I'm just putting two and two together now too. This might be a real guardian angel thing. Do you know what the name of the lady is who told me to do the guardian angel thing? Laura. Laura, that's what I was talking about. I just now made that connection. I just oh, looked it up because wow. she wrote me up. So I called Laura and I said, Laura, I said, you're not going to believe. So I recounted the story I just told her. She says, I don't doubt it at all. She said, let me pray about it and see if I can get a kind of a confirmation and I'll let you know. So then I called my friend, Stephen Roberts, and I said, Stephen, I said, it's the sign, Ralph Lauren. I said, and it, it seems to be, I, I asked God, is it Ralph or is it Lauren or is it some version of either of those? And he said, well, let me ask my guardian angel and I'll get back with you. So, so I leave it go. Well, within the hour, I get a call from both of them and I get a call from Lauren, from Laura. And she said, I think I've just gotten, I think I've just gotten all I need to know. She said, after you, when I took your call, I went into my boss's office and I sat down there because he's not in today and I could have some peace and quiet to listen to you. She said, I just sat there for a few more minutes trying to pray about what you've just told me. 
and she said, as I, as my gaze wandered around the road, I noticed that he's a fisherman and he um, has his wallpaper papered with nautical equipment. And there are all these round dials on his wall and they are all called Lorenz, which is a depth finder for the fish. It's called a Loren. And he said, so I think your guardian angel's name is Lauren taking you into the depths. Oh, wow. So then my friend Stephen calls and he said, I looked up your two names, Ralph and Lauren in the dictionary. He says, Lauren means to explore the depths. Mm -hmm. I think you have two guardian angels because Ralph means protector from the wolves. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think you've got two guardian angels. Lauren is going to lead you into the depths of God. And Ralph is going to protect you from the wolves who will not understand what you're trying to say. Wow. So I do believe I've got two guardian angels, Ralph and Lauren, and I call on them. And I, and I can tell you stories about my son. His guardian angel's name is Sal. And it's another story for another time. Okay. Now, after that, and, and maybe we'll try tie this guardian angel thing up uh, on this note. Um, so, so Maria, I hope that partly answers your question. Yes, but let me let me. So, so, too. so later, I asked my friend Laura, the one who told me how to pray to know the name of my guardian angel. I asked Laura, um, "Do you think um, maybe this was earlier?" I'm not going to read you this. Uh, it's it's too personal for one thing, and it doesn't exactly fit into our um, uh, into our discussion today. So I'm going to leave that that for another time. Um, so yeah, so there are guardian angels. Uh, I wouldn't get too hokey with it. I wouldn't because the problem with saying the angel prayer at night and then the next day is you start to look over your shoulder and then you'll never see it. So, so it's better. And so it was great that I forgot about it completely, you know, and that's how angels are. They, but they are protecting us and they are there, but they never impose and they, they never cajole and they, 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 they really don't understand us. All they know they really don't understand us. They don't understand why we sin. They don't understand why we feel love. Do, I, do they have love for God? I'm not exactly sure. They, they, they are one with God's will. Yeah. So they, they, they obey God. They, they see themselves as the servants of God. Well, maybe I will read you what Laura wrote me. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have to do this because I'm being a little coy there, by the way. Anyway, so. Okay, well, I can't remember when I got this for, from Laura, but it was around, will I ever make it back to the priesthood? Will I ever be in a position for Ralph and Lauren to actually help me? Will I ever function again as a priest? And Laura said, I'll pray about it and I'll let you know. And here's, she wrote me this in an email and she, she's, she said, this is, these are the words that came to me. So she's recording what she saw. In, either in a trance or in, in her spirit or what it was. So it says this, my dear son, Phil, you have returned to me and I am rejoicing in your return as Hosea did when his wife came home to him. Your doubts and fears have kept you from me. Together we will face them all and you will remain faithful. You have been obedient, you have been a disciple, but now you will be, be a servant, my servant. You will serve me to my people through the Eucharist. You will serve my people through me. I will be their God and you will be their servant. This is not the role you yourself aspire, were aspiring to, but it is the role I have destined for you. You will be required to bend further than you ever imagined possible, but I will not let you break. You will become meek and humble, selfless and kind. As your own son, Ben, has helped you become the man that you are, my son will help you become the man you are meant to be. Wow. Wow. She said, that's what I have. 
So that was and, and it was true. And and maybe it's coming true. We we hope Isn't and that pray. Coming true? Uh, God knows. <laughs> I, all I can say is you are I, back in the, uh, uh, preschool. Yes, yes, yes. So um yeah, all that having been said, those are angel stories. What else is there now? Anything uh was there something else we touched on at the beginning that we wanted to that I said I would talk about. I mean, I did talk about the evil angels, but it doesn't seem quite right at this moment. And you went over um, the, the whole program because you expected that other person. Yeah, I don't think the other person did come. Celia is there. Um, well, I think um, there's Gretchen zipping up her jacket. I guess she didn't get the stop video. <laughs> <That's age. laughs> I'm so tired. Yeah. Talking about, talking about like the um, Satan and all the, the angels that did fall away. Yeah. Because I've been asked that a lot, like yeah. even at PSR. And yeah, I don't want to. We'll talk a little bit about why, why in theory, it we should be open to the possibility of the of Satan and all his minions um, kind of experiencing a final conversion. So I, I, you know, I told you, I, I touched on this briefly last week, right? I even read from that book. And, and um, I mean, the, the, and, and really, I don't want, I, I mean, I hesitate to even bring up the subject because it's controversial. We are not in a position where we could actually go through the passages, or I don't want to put turn this gathering into a to a forum in which we go through the pat. There are a number of passages in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, all of which I affirm completely. Okay, all I would try to do if we were doing a class on the angels in the Catechism, I try to try to give you a larger Trinitarian theological um, vision that would help us. Uh, expand some of the implications and the omissions of, of those passages in the Catechism of the Catholic Church regarding the angels and regarding the fallen angels. And one of the, one of the, um, one of the assertions there that people often hold on to, and I don't have the Catechism in front of me, I'm not going to look it up on the internet, so please keep any of this discussion with your friends or beyond this gathering a non-argumentative okay it's meant to be meant to be um, um, uh, thought provoking rather than argumentative uh, i'm just i'm just trying to articulate as best as i can uh, a large stream of the early tradition that that if didn't if not only not only believed in but at least hoped for the final change of the angels, and one of the one of the passages that those who don't want to be open to that possibility hold on to, and there are many, and there's different versions of this. And I think one day we we do need to do a, if not a class, a gathering on on um, the three basic probabilities possibilities around scripture and tradition regarding universal salvation. So there are. There are Christian universalists, I count myself among those, who say, and it's very Pauline, and, and there's lots of scripture that can be marshaled for it, but there's also scripture that can be marshaled for the other positions, which is limited salvation and, and, uh, and actually some very narrow interpretations of salvation. So over the centuries, who will be saved and how they are saved? has been debated. That's why we have different Christian denominations. That's why we have divisions within the church. And even within the Catholic church, you have those like Baron and Hans Urs von Balthasar, who are hopeful universalists, but they don't assert it with any kind of certitude. Um, there was many cardinals at the Second Vatican Council who, when talking about the doctrine of hell and should we keep it in and how do we discuss it without alienating people who don't believe in it anymore. They said, well, one of the fathers of the council said, well, we can, we must assert the possibility of hell, but we don't have to assert the actuality of anybody being in it. 
but there's lots of ways of trying to finesse that, both philosophically and scripturally, okay? And, and it, it would require more nuance and more discussion than what I'm able to do. I've developed a little grid to try to lay out the three positions and how they argue and how they go about it, where it fits into tradition, where it fits into scripture, and where it fits into just everyday philosophical reasoning. And I, I, I cannot come down in any other position that in the end all will be well, as Saint, as, as Julian of Norwich said, nor can I come down in any other position than what St. Paul said, God will be all in all. And all there, and I can show you scripturally, there's been tons of stuff written about this. The all there includes everything in created in the created universe, including created spirits even if they themselves have fallen. And I think we talked last week about the difficulty of explaining the fall of the angels, uh, because if we blame the fall of human beings on the angels, we have to blame the fall of angels on somebody. And if we don't blame it on God, who are we going to blame it on? And if we do blame it on God, do we really have a God we want to believe in? So all of that figures into the thinking about universal salvation. Maria, yeah, you want to ask I was something? Thinking that I remember from my religious upbringing about uh, many people will be called but few will be chosen yeah 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 you can pick almost any scripture you want and twist it in any way that you want scripture scripture yeah. is used by anyone so that, so maria if you didn't hear maria's comment she said i remember From many people's you know she remembered the bible quote many are called few are chosen yeah. now it's absolute exegetical ignorance to yes. think that that yes. necessarily applies to the hereafter. Really? Okay, so learning how to interpret any particular line of scripture requires enormous understanding of the culture, the context, the purpose for which it was written, the context in which it was originally uttered, the cultural conditions under which it was uttered, what it sounds like an insult to us, can sound like a humorous joke to an Israeli, and what sounds like a joke to us can be an unforgivable sin in the Middle East. So until we understand the culture, we really don't understand anything about scripture. So that's part of understanding scripture growing in a linguistic and, and grammatical and cultural contextual understanding of, of when these were said and when they were written and understanding that the written version it does not necessarily match the oral version. And I mean, I spent 30 years studying that stuff. And I find it interesting, but not really helpful to the ordinary Catholic. All I'm telling you is beware of handling scripture for any other purposes than Lexio Divina, because when you do that, it's just like using statistics. Look at what's happening yeah, in our country yeah, with yeah, COVID. Yeah. Anybody can cite any number they want and make it say anything they want. Yeah. So scripture like data is used by people more like the drunk uses the lampstand on the uses the street light on the street corner more for support than illumination okay <laughs> so most people right. don't quote scripture for illumination they quote it to support a position they've already taken so most people come to the scripture this is the point most people come to the scripture with a theory about heaven and hell they come to the scripture with a theory. Where did they get the theory? From their parents or from their Sunday school teacher or from the nuns in grade school. Where did those nuns get it? They got it. It's a big game of telephone here. You heard it from them and they heard it from you and you heard it from them. But if you go all the way back, that's why I always push us all the way back to the beginning of the, beginning of the telephone game. And what you have there are people like St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Athanasius, Origen, the, 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 the Alexandrian, promoting a universal view of salvation that they basically got from St. Paul and from St. John, that God will restore all things in Christ. He has come into the world to reconcile all things in himself. Now, if you don't believe in that going in, or for, if you're not at least open to the possibility that God could make all things new, you're never going to see it when you read it. You're going to read it a thousand times and you're going to be just like the people Jesus said and said to the Pharisees. You have eyes, but you do not see. You have ears, but you do not hear. You've got your mind already made up. So it takes a real special grace of the Holy Spirit 
to, to, to jettison what I think I know about God. See, the, 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 the uniqueness of the, of the New Testament, the uniqueness of Christ, the revolutionary good news of the gospel is the final reconciliation of all things with God. That is the good news. Yeah. But, but if you read the New Testament through the lens of the Old Testament, you're going to still believe that there has to be a part of anger in God. So maybe Jesus didn't mention it, but it's got to be there. No, God is as Jesus does. So Jesus re overturns the vision of God in the Old Testament. Jesus overturns our notions of God as one just like us, but writ large, you know? So, so we like to get back at people, and so does God. Listen to the, the reading today in the book of Jonah. Jonah's mad that Nineveh repented and God forgave him. And then also earlier in the book of Jonah, it says God repented of the evil he was going to do. And I, and I laugh at that. And, and you, if you knew the historical context, you would laugh at that. That's the author saying God is appealing to God for God. <laughs> God who's God repenting to? Himself. Which means that he must have already assumed he's more merciful than he's already acting in the Old Testament. Okay, and you're never going to see the humor in that. You're never going to see the point of that. That God is pointing to a God who's greater than the God who's being portrayed. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're never going to see it. And, and I'm never going to convince anybody of it if their mind is made up. Okay, so everybody is reading the scripture, everybody is looking at Christ, everybody is going to church through their own lens. The only way I'm going to really see things as God sees them is replace my, my lens with his lens. And his lens is given to certain people for, for proclamation. St. Paul began to think with the lens or the mind of Christ. The early church fathers saw themselves as doing nothing other than amplifying what St. Paul brought to bear on the gospel. Even the apostles themselves, St. Paul, I mean, this is the scandal of St. Paul. St. Paul, and this is why St. Paul and St. Peter never got along. St. Paul was convinced to his dying day, even though I never met Christ in the flesh, I understand who he is and what he is up to better than any of you guys who walked around him. You can't see the forest for the trees. You're still stuck on him as a historical person. I know him as the Lord of the cosmos. What he did for me, he's doing for everything. The stars, the animals, the plants, he's renewing it all. He's bringing new life into this cosmos that was dead before he came into it. No amount of law, no amount of legal negotiation with God is going to get you to understand the miracle of Christ Jesus risen from the dead. When he rises, the whole cosmos rises with him because all things were created for him. All things were created with him. All things were created in him. In him, we live and move and have our being. How can anybody not be divine who lives in him? Lots of people can be living in him and not know it, like a fish swimming in water and not knowing it. God, if I could just give this homily on Sunday, I'd be the happiest man. <laughs> ever. You need to all pray for me. I have to okay. preach at my 50th year reunion at Notre Dame with all these multimillionaires who don't know a freaking thing about the immediate presence of God. I shouldn't say that. God, they probably it do. They it do. does not appear, but my job is to awaken them in seven minutes or less. So I need your prayers. Four, okay. Four okay. thirty, St. Louis time Sunday. Ah. I expect an outpouring of inspiration this Four Sunday. Thirty. This so Sunday. Light yeah, yeah, light a candle. Yeah. Pray to the guard. Yeah. I'll pray to the guardian yeah. angels. Ralph and Lauren, come on now. Maybe they'll appear on either side of me. That would shock that living be Jesus yeah. out of them, wouldn't it? Okay, well, you get this. So, so, so all those things being said, all the angels like us are creatures. Okay, they are not infinite. They do not, no, cre no creature has any power other than what God has given them. 
Okay, we don't we don't need to know why the angels went wrong. All we know is that for reasons known only to God, well, maybe I put it this way: for reason for reasons permitted by God, they went bad, or at least what we consider to be bad. We don't know what's good or bad. Only God knows. Yeah. See, so you have to start surrendering. We don't know. Stop judging lest you be judged. Don't judge. We don't know. So, given the fact that we don't know, we, what we can be confident of is that whatever happened, nothing happens that God doesn't, doesn't know about, that God doesn't permit, and that God doesn't deliberately will out of love, for love. Everything that God does proceeds and returns to love. It's our, it's our state of having been deceived by the deceiver. Now, why he became a deceiver? He was deceived. But why God permitted that, God alone knows. What I can tell you is he did it because everything that has come from it results in a greater love. I can tell you that with absolute confidence. And if you believe that, all your problems disappear. But very few people will believe that. And I say that because God is love. God is light in whom there is no darkness. Love does not have a, a malevolent side to it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is generous. Love forgives. Love does not ask why. God's love is a wireless love. All love is wireless. <laughs> Real love is wireless. It's without a why, just is. So you're stupid to ask any questions of God. It's actually an affront to God. But he permits it. He lets it because he knows that's who we are and how we are. Okay. So with that, we've got that God knows the angels were going to go sour. He knows that they were going to deceive. He knew that they were going to fall, you know, blah, blah, blah. He knows, it. he knows all of it. He knows that we are going to fall prey to what they lie to us about. Okay. Where am I going with this? Um, yeah. So the world's in a mess because of the fallen really? angels. Really? Now, I've said several times on this gathering about, about, about why God has allowed us through the influence of the deceiver to fall so far, and we're falling even further. This, this country, this world is becoming an apocalyptic nightmare. Christ predicted it. It's happening. There is no social cohesion. There is only tyranny. We're becoming a, a, a whole humanity of BBs in a bread box, just rolling around, colliding with each other. The bonds of magnetism, family, marriage, country, they're gone. There are tyrants out there trying to weld things together for their own purposes, but the whole kitten caboodle is broken. All under the influence of evils, angels who are also broken. Okay. Now, what St. Irenaeus said, reflecting on this, because it was just as bad in the first century when he was put to death for his faith. He said, he said, all of this was permitted by God, essentially, so he could show the power of his ability to restore what is so broken that you think there's no hope for it. He had to make you hopeless of your own condition to show you that you should never lose hope. So the exact quote is, since he who saves always existed, it was necessary that those who would need to be saved, men and angels, it was necessary that those who would need to be saved, who were deceived, who fell, who broke, it was necessary that those who would need to be saved, without saying how they would come to need to be saved, the origins of evil are unknown. Irenaeus, 
since he who saves always existed, it was necessary that those who would need to be saved should be created. We were created good. We were created unbroken. But we would need to be saved because we would become unbroken. We would become broken. God knew that. We would become deceived. We would become a disaster. He knew that. He didn't, he didn't cause it. He knew it. We're still free. Since he who saves always existed, it was necessary that those who would need to be saved should be created. All those pluperfect tenses in there, whatever they are. So that he who saves should not exist in vain. Since he who saves always existed, it was necessary that a broken world and a broken celestial hierarchy should be created so that he who restores them to God's fullness of love should not exist without being able to demonstrate his merciful saving power. So evil angels exist for the purpose of Christ restoring them to their original beauty and their original union with God. And to believe that any finite creature through the exercise of their stubborn will could frustrate the infinite power of God, to think that the puner, puny power of human freedom is more power, because that's what the thing I read to you last week, that was basically saying, if we say the evil angels are not fall, are not saved, but they can hold out against God, we're essentially affirming Satan is stronger, or at least as strong as God. And that's a Gnostic heresy of Gnosticism. There's two gods, Satan and God. They're just, they're rivals, they're equal powers. God happens to be victorious, but Satan still is right up there. He's not right up there with God. He's a creature just like the rest of us. So compared to God, his power is nothing. And I say, therefore, with many church fathers, God permitted him to have the power of deception for the purpose of showing that his deceptive power is as nothing compared to the merciful restorative power of the risen one. God, I love myself. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, I, I love, I honestly, because I know I'm nothing. Everything you're getting here is straight from God. And I, if I evaporate today, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. I plan to say that at the reunion. Watch God, just watch me just disappear. <laughs> Honestly, I, could, I, I really say and believe I could die a happy person today. The only reason I'm here is to keep talking. And, and the only reason Satan is there is to keep deceiving. Until such time as God as God feels the evil is strong enough to demonstrate everybody who's enveloped in it can now see how beautiful his son is by stopping the damn thing. Okay, this is not to minimize child abuse or people who are tortured. It is truly evil, okay? But we don't see it as God sees it. And, and if you read people like George MacDonald or many of the early church fathers, especially Gregory of Nyssa, if you ever can read Gregory, it's very short, Gregory of Nyssa on the Resurrection. Uh, two, two great books by Gregory of Nyssa on the making of human beings, on the making of man, and on the resurrection. They're two separate books. You can get them on, you can get them on Kindle for 99 cents. Oh, wow. You will catch a glimpse there. He's a little difficult to read, but the translations are good. He's, uh, you'll get a glimpse there of how your life would be filled with joy if you saw everything, even as it collapses on the way back to restoration. And that's the vision that Gregory operated from. Because how could you not? Um, and there was a thought there that I just lost the thread to that I wanted to finish, but there it is. So what is the book's name? On the Resurrection and on the Making of Man. So man was made to be restored. And he, Gregory makes the point that angels are no less creatures than man. 
So they have no more substance in themselves. The angels, angels, good or bad, men and women, good or bad, are, are in themselves nothing. All their being comes from God. It's a gift from God. Everything is a gift. And it was for the sake of the son that the father created these gifts. And it's for the sake of the son that he allowed the gifts to be broken, trampled on, and misused, and even annihilated, so that his son, in gratitude to the father, could raise all those broken entities back up into more beautiful gifts than they were before the father gave them to him in the first place. Kind of like my mother said, always leave the room better than what, what you found it. That's kind of what Jesus is saying to his father. I'm leaving the human race better than you created it, despite the fact, not despite the fact, in tandem with the fact that you allowed it to collapse so that you could allow me to demonstrate your glory through my power to restore as the one who saves. So you have to continue to think of Jesus as the redeemer, even within the life of the Trinity. You have to think of Jesus as, as, a, human be, as a human being, even in the life of the Trinity before there were any human beings. The human beings were created by the Father after the begetting of his son, because in the begetting of his son, he sees the God-man. He begot a God-man. And so there had to be a man for the God, the God man to be one with and to be one with the man for whom who were created for the sake of the God man to be one with the to be one with humanity for whose sake they to be for to be one with humanity whose creation was for the sake of the God man for the God man to be one with that humanity is to be healed by the God of man. Because, well, I'm, I'm confusing here, the humanity of human beings was one with Christ from all eternity. So humanity was a sharer or a partaker of the divine nature even prior to our creation. We have lost an experiential sense of that communion through deception. And that's what's being restored. We are being restored to our original divine human union with the God-man in the mystery of redemption and the history of the world. But it's all, it's all a prayer between the Father and the Son. It's all, humanity is a, humanity, the whole of humanity is, is, as it were, an afterthought to God the Father. The only thought the Father ever has is for the Son. The Father only cares for us because of his Son. His Son is the one who's one with us. So in caring for his Son, the Father also cares for us. It's like that friend of my son's. I told you that story before. The guy showed up at the door one day in high school. He said, I'm Michael Gary. And I said, yeah, so? And he said, well, I'm, 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 a, I'm a good friend of your son's. I said, oh, you are? Come on in. <laughs> the relationship changed immediately because of his association. So the whole of humanity is from all eternity associated with the son. That's as the begotten one, he also has with it. He is also the one who would become incarnate. And we are the ones who would be created for the sake of the one who would become incarnate. And the one who would become incarnate became incarnate so that those who would become human would need to be restored to full communion because they would have become broken through deception. And both the deceived and the deceivers will be restored. Christ is, and, and I told you last week that, you know, apocryphally, I mean, in full tradition, that's the reason Satan fell in the first place, that God showed Satan that the, the only begotten one, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, has a closer relationship with humanity than he does with the angelic world. It's not that angels are lesser in God's sight, they're just different. And, and, and I guess in a certain sense, they are lesser because they were sent to be guardians of us. 
And Satan said, the hell with that. And there it was. <laughs> yeah, right. The hell with that. When I say I will not serve, that is hell. When I say I'm not going, I'm not going into that meeting. I'm not going to that party. I'm putting my feet down. I'm not going. I will not go. I will not. Well, you know, this is why I believe in the final restoration is hell. I mean, so if God says to the, to the evil angels, okay, you know, um, well, I told you, I to, well, I'll use, so we'll finish today. I'll tell you a little story, okay? Because I tell these stories sometimes in the homilies. So you heard about, you know, a guy died and he went to, went up to the pearly gates as so many people childishly imagine the, the transition to be in. There's a long line of people waiting there, you know, and there's St. Peter's up there. And, but pretty, you know, and it, I mean, it's miles. So they're just chatting in line, waiting for their time to be judged. And, and as they get closer to the gates, he hears some murmuring and he notices that people are turning around in line and they got these, everybody's got kind of a shocked expression on their face. And, and he says, what are they saying? What, what's, what's going on? And so the, the telephone tag comes down the line here and, and the lady turns around and they said, he's letting everybody in. And he says, what? <laughs> yeah, he's letting everybody in. He's letting everybody in. Yeah, tell the next guy. He's letting everybody in. Well, most people are like Jonah. What the hell? What do you mean they're letting everybody? In? What's it? What? Huh? You're paying him the same wage you're paying me? I worked all freaking day for you. You're paying me the same wage? They're letting everybody in. Well, as he gets closer, he notices some people are saying, he's letting everybody in. But there's a little group over on the side. And he hears a lady in front of him saying, if he's letting Teresa in, I'll be damned if I'm going in. I'll be, I, there's no freaking way I'm going. You think I'm spending eternity with that idiot? I ain't, forget that stuff. I ain't going in. So there's a whole group of people that's starting to grow in number saying, I'll be damned if I'm going in with them. And, and pretty soon, all you can hear is this big chorus, I'll be damned, I'll be damned. And of course, that's what it is. All judgment is damnation, except the one you're condemning is yourself. Okay, now imagine that. That's usually where I go with the parable and they all laugh and I go on with the homily. Okay, but today... Imagine the evil angels over there trying to stoke the fire, okay? And they're out there, and I'll be damned, and I'll be damned, and they're start stand outside, but the gates are still open, okay? And the party's going on, and the light is shining, and the joy is coming. And every once in a while, Jesus peeks out and says, come on in, still lots of food. Got a big banquet in here, you're, you're welcome. Hey! Old Scrooge, bah humbug, we're not going in. So imagine that going on for infinity. I remember I went to a party one time and I was, I don't know, I had my shorts on a knot for some reason. I said, I'm not going in. And I stood out there, you know, and the poor nice lady would come out every once. After a while, it got cold. <laughs> I said, uh. so you see, it's eventually swallowing your pride. And what the early church fathers said is they said basically this, no matter how stubborn a person is, no matter how overtired a child is, because we are finite, because there are limits to our patience, even evil has its limits because God has set limits to it. It's finite. It's not infinite. It can't last forever. No creature can outlast God. So eventually the resistance has to break down. Now, all the church fathers, even the ones, those who believed in universal salvation as I do, or I believe because they believe and it makes perfect sense to me. Even they said that as the breakdown of resistance occurs, and I'm going to be preaching this in how many minutes now? I have a funeral here right after this yeah. gathering. And I'm going to say the same thing. When people exit this life, they pass into the mercy of God. And the mercy of God is a consuming fire. When we say, I'm in love with somebody, my heart is on fire. 
I, John, John of the Cross put it so beautifully. One night, fired with love's urgent longings. Okay, so God is a consuming fire of love. But everything that is not of love, everything that is of pride, everything that is of stubbornness, it goes into that fire and it sizzles. We call it purgatory. The early church fathers called it hell. Hell and purgatory. What we call purgatory is what the early church called hell. It's the fires of Gehenna. It's the worm gnawing at your soul. No, I won't do it. I won't do it. All of that is burned out. All of that is purified. And, and if you've ever tried to, I mean, you know what it's, most of you mothers, grandmothers know what it is to deal with an obstreperous child. They kick and they scream, but they can't do it forever. You hold them to yourself and they kick and you absorb it. And then they just peter themselves out. There is no way under God's good son that even the angel, evil angels won't just stop kicking against the goat. Saint, Jesus said that to St. Paul. When will you stop kicking against the goat? When will you stop banging your head against the wall? If you need to do it a little longer. See, people don't awaken until they've suffered enough. When the pain, and, and this is what they say in AA, but it goes for purgatory as well. When the and purgatory is nothing other than than how many ever many years you need to stand in the outer darkness cursing the darkness, but eventually you'll get sick and tired of it, or you'll die. But I mean, dying in the afterlife is dying to your to your to your resistance. That's what it is. So better to die to it now than then. And in AA, they say when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you'll wake up, you'll be sober. When, you, when, when the pain of holding on becomes greater than the pain of letting go, you'll let go. And God, as we know, is a mystery of letting go-ness. It's where there's no grudges. There's nothing to kick against. There's nothing to fight. There's nothing to judge. There's nothing to get mad about. It's always new. It's always more interesting. The remorse in heaven is, why didn't I do this sooner? But even that's burned up. Even that's burned out. And the burning process will, from the sinner's standpoint, feel painful in some way, even agonizing. That's why we talk about the pains of hell. And there are pains of hell. But I can go through them right now by just letting go of my resentments. I don't have to have a lot of pain when I die. I just have to be in a space of complete surrender to God and trust him completely. So, but easier said than done, right? So, yeah. well, let's finish it there. I'm going to uh, go to the funeral here and say yeah. some words of yeah. good hope and yeah. ask all of you to pray for me on Sunday so that something halfway decent comes out of this mouth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you all.